Hello everyone. Um, I think we'll we'll make a start just now. That's five past. I know there's, there's people are still joining us, but we'll go over the the kind of introductions and housekeeping component just now. Can I ask um, if everyone just turns off the, their camera just now, just to preserve bandwidth? Because I think we're expecting quite a few more people to turn up. OK, so um, we'll get started. Um, thanks very much for coming along, everyone. Um, my name is 
Gordon Hay. I'm the Senior Improvement Advisor uh, on the Personality Disorder Improvement Programme. Uh, and we're delighted to have you all along today. So a couple of bits of housekeeping first before we um, do some more um, introductions. Next slide, please. So for those that are not familiar with Teams, the kind of layout is, is here on the screen. Um, there's a, a panel across the top. So number one in the, the kind of speech bubble is the, the chat box. If you click on there, you'll get the chat down the side of the, the screen. You can use that panel to introduce yourself, please. Um, and then you can, any questions that, that you have, please type them in there. Um, we, we won't have time for questions during the presentations, but we should have time for pre some questions towards the end. And we'll also we'll look at all of the questions that are raised and we'll look at addressing those over the um, future sessions that we're planning. OK, so that, that speech bubble. Um, if everyone please uh, mutes their mic and also I wish I knew how to mute my phone. It's going off here all over the place anyway. Um, and cameras off to preserve the bandwidth. Um, and then at the end of the meeting, hit the leave box. And I'll take you out of the meeting. Um, still coming in. Go to the next slide, please. So the meeting's going to be recorded, so please don't anyone else record on, on their system. That tends, to, apparently that overwrites our session, so we, we won't have the recording if anyone else is, is doing it. And next slide, please. So the day is going to look like, like this. I'm doing the welcomes and introductions. We're going to have um, one of our clinical leads, Andrea Williams from Greater Glasgow and Clyde, will be setting the scene and talking about, about the journey to um, creating this programme. I'll give an overview of the programme. Um, Louise Christie, a partner from Scottish Recovery Network, will talk about the very important element of work that um, they're conducting, working with people with lived experience as part of the programme. And our other clinical lead, Dr Michelle Veldman, will uh, provide a, a presentation looking at psychological treatments. We'll then have, um, hopefully have some time for some question and answers afterwards. OK, um, right, so I think people are still coming in thick and fast by the alerts on my phone, but um, we'll, we'll get going just now. So I'd like to thank everyone for coming along today. We're delighted that we've had so much interest in the programme. It's, it's very reassuring, reassuring to see so many people from diverse backgrounds joining us today. The fact that, that we've had such a spread of attendees from all over Scotland, a wide range of professional groups, third sector and people with lived experience is particularly pleasing and it, it gets to the heart of what a programme is all about. Uh, as I said today, we'll hear from our, um, our clinical leads, Andy Williams and Michelle Vel Veldman, um, Louise Christie and myself. Um, we should have opportunity for about two or three questions towards the end, um, but please pop any questions that you have in the chat box um, and we'll, we'll, we'll address those. Um, after the event, if we're not able to do so today. Um, a couple of things to say maybe around, around about language. So we, we've named our programme the Personality Disorder Improvement Programme, uh, and that's kind of following on from the precedent of the, the Scottish Personality Disorder Network, which is a national group with membership drawn from uh, lived experience community and from professionals. And we make reference um, at times during the presentation to working with people with a diagnosis of personality disorder. Um, our focus and our core values as a team are firmly on the people part of that. Ours is a, a completely person-centred approach. 
we, we don't use the form of words as a label or any reductive, negative or stigmatising associations. We're working with people, not diagnoses. And the term per personality disorder can be very contentious. We know that there's many ongoing debates around the use of language and the complexities around about diagnosis and non-diagnosis. So borderline personality disorder, emotionally unstable personality disorder, complex emotional needs, emotional in intensity disorder, emotional dysregulation, complex post-traumatic stress disorder. These all fall within the remit of our programme. Um, and there are entirely understandable concerns around stigma and there are strongly held views around about the subject. I'm sure that we'll have discussions around about these themes throughout the programme. Uh, and we want to hear from all perspectives and we'll do that on a basis of mutual respect and, uh, and understanding. So. With, with, with no further ado, I would like to introduce um, my colleague Andy Williams. Who will speak? Who will speak? You will speak. I will speak. Thank you, Gordon. Hi, welcome everybody. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Um, I'll crack on and just um, my, my job is just to give a little bit of um, a background and history, I guess, leading to the, the launch of this programme and to think just for a few minutes at the start about what we could learn from all the history that's gone before of different reports, different evidence different pilot projects um, that have come before and there, there have been a lot of uh, there has been a lot of work um, across the UK and internationally around this area. So can I have the next slide please? I thought I'll just highlight a few of the, the kind of bits of history. If we dive right back to 2003, there were a couple of reports published in England um, this one personality disorder capabilities framework, which really got at um, what are what are the qualities and capabilities required in staff to support people well with this diagnosis? How do we train staff? How do we meet the needs of people who present to our services? And that led on to the, uh, a big training programme, the KUF training programme that I'll, I'll mention. Um, next picture. Thank you. Um, and the same year was um, quite a seminal document, the Personality Disorder No Longer a Diagnosis of Exclusion document in England. Um, which highlighted really that people in 2003 were unable to access care often, that staff felt unskilled, they didn't have the training. The, the document outlined some, some broad sort of guidance for trusts in England about how to deliver good services, and it actually came with a follow up with funding for some um, pilot projects to try and sort of address different models of care um, and develop services. Next picture, please. If we jump forward a lot of years to, to 2019, this is again in England, um, there's a, a consensus statement was released and this was led by a, an MP, Norman Lamb, and a number of different organisations signed up to this consensus statement, including MIND, Royal College of Nursing, Royal College of GPs, the British Psychological Society. And 16 years on from those reports I just mentioned, there were still statements in this report saying we must stop the appalling treatment that people often experience. It did also highlight some pockets of excellent practice um, and highlighted also some of the issues around the, the controversy, controversies around diagnosis um, and, and a, a bit of thinking about how early intervention might be helpful to, to really focus on. And the next picture. Thanks. And then there was a, a Royal College of Psychiatrists statement um, from the National UK College. Muted, Andy. Thank you. I don't know how that happened. Thank you. So the college position statement um, outlined that Evidence and knowledge has grown over the interve intervening years since these early reports, but also the gap between knowledge and practice had grown. So that there was still the problem of piecemeal limited services. And this, this report also highlighted again that debate around diagnosis exists, but came down on the side of thinking that, um, that there's something helpful about diagnosis sometimes if it means um, the benefit is access to, to good treatment and, and highlighted the treatability. 
So next slide, please. Thank you. So what have all these reports achieved? I suppose that's the important question. There's been all these reports, all this, all this work. And I guess that there's evidence that some things have, have changed. There was the development of a huge training programme across England, which was innovative in that it was co-produced with people with lived experience, that it was delivered around thousands, tens of thousands of staff. Um, the, the organisation and, and funding of that training programme kind of faltered and, and has had to be relaunched. So there's, there's issues around sustainability and, and support for programmes that are successful. And again, I think the same applies to the pilot projects that followed the original reports in 2003. There, were, there was evidence of really good service developments across the country, some promising results, but again, a problem with sustainment and um, sharing learning from, from some of those um, developed services. So the funding for that came to an end around 2011 and it depended on sort of local interest to keep those services going and to, to further the, the um, learning across systems. So no consistency and, and difficult to, to follow um, what, what the good practice outcomes from that are. The little table there just gives an idea that there had been change over that period in England. Um, so this is, these are figures for England, the English trusts. That as a result of all this work and, and, and reports that there was an increase in, in specialist services for people with a diagnosis of personality disorder and a, a decrease in the numbers of trusts that said they didn't provide services. So the idea that it's no longer a diagnosis of exclusion was is, is beginning to shift, we hope, towards it, it not being a diagnosis of exclusion. So the next slide. I guess then we come to Scotland and have a think about what, what we're doing in Scotland. We didn't want to be left out, so we, we produced some of our own reports and the Royal College of Psychiatrists in Scotland produced this report in 2018 after identifying this as a, a priority um, with these aims of promoting awareness and campaigning for better services and outcomes for people um, and, and sort of starting the process of mapping some of the services in Scotland in an initial way. And the next slide. And rather helpfully, at the same time, I think there's been a bit of a building momentum since 2018 because the Mental Welfare Commission also released a, a very informative report, really diving into the, the lived experience of people with, with this diagnosis, their families and carers, um, also asking mental health staff and GPs and a &E staff about their experience of working with people. And again, you can see from that quote that the picture is still that people are having varying experiences about getting the diagnosis, about getting access to therapies, and that there are challenges still to, to face. So next slide, this is my last one. So really all of this led to a bit of a kind of building of momentum towards the point where the, um, the Scottish Government included in the programme for government in 2019, the commitment to um, establish a personality disorder network. And that led to lots of discussions between the Scottish Personality Disorder Network, the Scottish Government, the College, and now HIS, and has led us to this point. So I'm going to pass back to Gordon to, to introduce us to what our programme is going to look like and how it might address some of the, the challenges. Thanks very much, Andy. Um, so, can I have the, the first slide, please? The, the aim of this programme, which is funded in the first instance for until March 23, uh, is to better understand what the landscape of service provision is for people with a diagnosis of personality disorder in Scotland. Um, we're going to do so by bringing together a, a wide range of stakeholders and looking to identify key opportunities for, for a future improvements and develop proposals in discussion with Scottish Government around about what phase two might look like post-March next year. And the longer term aspiration is that people with a diagnosis of personality disorder in Scotland will have timely access to, um, to effective care and treatment, in, including access self, to self-management, emotional skills training, focus on recovery. Slide please. The kind of high level timeline of some of the, the program is is outlined here. So we've we're, we're very confident that we've recruited um, an excellent team. We've got all the right people 
in the right the right positions within the team, which include were two clinical leads, um, myself, program management team, knowledge information specialists, social researcher, um, and uh, admin staff to drive the program along and, and grow as, as large engagement as we can from from throughout Scotland. So there, there are. There are three principal aspects to the program, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those in a wee bit more detail in the following slides. But um, you can see we, we're going to undertake a strategic gap analysis. Um, the preliminary work around about engagement with boards and HSCP localities and other stakeholders has already started around about that. Um, we have commissioned a third sector organisation, so Scottish Recovery Network along with Vox will be undertaking some really important work about um, engagement with people with lived experience and feeding that back into the programme. Throughout, um, we are drawing together our expert reference group, which I'm, I'm delighted to say we, we have um, Tim Agnew from NHS Highland and uh, the Scottish Personality Disorder Network has agreed to chair. Our co-chair will be someone else from SPDN um, from the lived experience community. <clears throat> and we've got broad representation already in the, in the reference group from people from um, professional um, backgrounds across different specialisations and other people with lived experience. Um, the SRN Vox work will feed into that expert reference group as well to ensure that we have a, a, a broad range of voices. Another significant element of the programme is the, the learning system. We'll be running a series of webinars and workshops following this one, uh, exploring key themes, bringing people together from all backgrounds um, and engaging in lots of discussion. Um, that will produce, we'll produce some case studies from that and we'll also look at <coughs> producing some implementation toolkits. So the expectation is that we'll have say, final drafts around about December, January, and then engage in discussion with Scottish Government around about phase two. Next slide, please. So I, I'm not going to speak too much about this because Louise is going to um, speak in, in much more detail um, later on. So, but we have commissioned Scottish Recovery Network and Vox um, to use their skills and expertise and working with people with a, a diagnosis of personality disorder. Um, around the assessment of what people's actual experience of, of, of using services has been the good and the bad. Um, we'll look at learning from engaging with those people and, and bring that experience into the heart of the programme. It should run, that lived experience element should run through the programme like a, the writing in the stock of rock. Um, we're also engaging with other parts of, of HIS, such as the Community Engagement Director, and working very closely with the Scottish Personality Disorder Network as well to ensure that there's nothing tokenistic about an uh, approach to engaging with people with lived experience in the programme. It's, it, it's central, it's at the heart of the programme. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> the, the, the mapping of service provision roundabout um, personality disorder has already started. We've done say, desktop say, um, stakeholder mapping and initial discussions with a range of people within boards and health and social care partnerships and other organisations um, already. We are lining up um, virtual board visits and a kind of structured conversation to look in detail at the, the, the picture of service provision and also um, looking at, at what data is available and look at how we understand that data, including the stuff that we generate from our, our visits and looking to identify where gaps and inequality issues are. Um, our social researcher will also be undertaking work looking at staff experiences, looking at um, key barriers to providing high quality care. And again, there'll be the delivery of that final report with phase two recommendations at the end of the programme, but we'll look to pull that stuff together towards the end of the year. Slide, please. The learning system will consist of a, a series of, of 
of webinars, so kind of information given sessions. Um, I'm going to ask some some questions after these slides just to, to gauge um, what's going to work best for for you guys, because you're the guys that we actually want to be attending and participating within the programme, and it's all well and good as specifying that this is going to be um, how we, how we proceed. If people don't have capacity to engage with what we're offering, then it, then it won't work. So we want to sense check um, some of that stuff with you guys. But the initial proposal is that we probably have uh, the information given webinars. They'll, they'll happen every eight weeks. Um, there will be the last for about an hour and it'll be a keynote speaker and question and answer type um, arrangement. Every alternate eight weeks, so ensuring that we have something happening every four weeks. We'll have a series of workshops which will be more interactive with more breakout rooms, more discussion. Um, and they hopefully we can get them to about an hour and a half. Um, but th those will those will involve lots more um, engagement uh, opportunities for networking and um, learning from others experiences. And as part of the learning system, we'll develop some case studies and also practical resources that will um, support implementation of improvement work going forward. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the new overview of what the learning system is going to look like. So eight weekly webinars, eight weekly workshops. Um, you can see we have a launch webinar there thus to today, 31st of May. We know that um, our, the next webinar will, won't be eight weeks, it'll actually be six weeks just to um, to fit in our, our schedule. Um, and that will look at specialist services and integrated care pathways. That will be on July the 12th. Slide, please. The themes that we uh, have identified that we think are really important to explore throughout the, the learning system are there. So we're looking at lived experience and stigma. That will also incorporate um, lived experience and co-design. Um, integrated care pathway special services, as I said, will be webinar number one. We we'll look at unscheduled care and crisis, different therapeutic modalities, remote and rural issues, working with hard to reach populations, general mental health and secondary care, staff development, diagnosis including ICD-11. And while the, the principal city focus of, of, of this programme is the 18 to 65 age group, um, and we'll certainly be exploring lots of, um, with all of the boards, we'll be looking at, at transitions from CAMS and other services into, into the mainstream services. We felt that it would be really valuable and worthwhile to have a kind of standalone um, workshop or, or a couple of workshops with colleagues from 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 CAMS um, to have a particular kind of examination of personality disorder within CAMS and make some some recommendations round about that in the the final report to Scottish Government. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So we've got a bit of polling stuff to do here. So um, if we go to the the next slide then, please. Right. So if, if people could just um, submit answers to, to these, it will get, it'll give us a great insight into how best we can fashion the learning system to suit, uh, to suit needs. So how long would you prefer the webinars to be for? So those webinars are the information given Keynote speaker Q and A's. Go on. How long? How long would you prefer the workshops to be for? What are you most interested in in hearing about and discussing within the workshops?
are there any other topics out with the ones that we have uh, we've outlined here that people think are really important and would like to explore within the workshops or webinars? So it's just a free text response. Just type something in there and submit. What times are most suitable for webinars, workshops to start at? What days are most suitable? These polls will be in the chat, so if they, if they pop on and off your screen and you don't have time to, to put an answer in, you'll find them within the chat. And I think that might be the end of the polls. So I'm going to hand over now to Louise Christie from the Scottish Recovery Network. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Gordon. Um, I'm very glad to be here to talk to you today about our plans for a programme of engagement. So very briefly, Scottish Recovery Network is a small national initiative um, and we were set up to promote and support recovery and mental health. And over the last few years, we've done a lot of work to promote meaningful approaches to engaging people with lived experience and strategy development and service design. And we also do a lot of work around peer support. So we're working with Vox Scotland on this project to put together, our, you know, the fact that we, we both have got a strong interest in lived experience, but both operate in different ways. So if I, can I move on to the next slide, please? So one of the things that we really thought about when we started this project was how we could promote this as an opportunity that people felt was a safe space for them to get involved and explore their ideas. We wanted it, you know, as Gordon was saying, not to be about consultation or feedback, but it really genuinely to be about engaging with people and listening to what's important to them rather than sort of channeling it through a sort of patient feedback approach which we are moving away from, but it's still sometimes uh, people's experiences. So we have decided um, and we, we chatted with Vox and Vox members to have a with us for us approach to the project. Next slide, please. What we thought very much was that we needed to go through a process that built. We didn't want to just go out and talk to people and say what's important to you. And then we decided what was important about that. So using an approach that we have um, taken in other projects, we really there's three main stages in terms of the way we're going to work with people before we get to reports and the, the outputs. So the first stage which was started is a reaching out. So we've reached out to all of our contacts, and um, that's people with lived experience, um, including people who we know are involved in um, peer support groups, collective advocacy, and are interested in um, services for people experiencing complex mental health problems with uh, trauma issues, and also people who have or could have a diagnosis of personality disorder. But that's all, we're also contacting lots of the groups and organisations so that we can talk with them about how best we reach people. Because while we have this uh, approach, we've got lots of space in it to listen and to adapt what, how we meet with people, how we talk to them, how we pr provide spaces. We're also going to do a wee bit of uh, what we're calling lived experience research, and that is uh, to gather together and to look at the key themes coming out of the reports that many, many groups have provided. Um, and, and so there, this is not like academic literature, but it is a really valuable lived experience where people are sharing their views. And we're also looking to establish a project group. 
a lived experience project group um, of people who can help guide us through this project and hopefully over time become involved in the engagement, but also get involved in things like the expert advisory group. And our role with them is to put that group together, but also to really invest in people and to make sure that they feel supported before, during and after they get involved in any type of engagement and facilitation or work where they're seen maybe to be speaking on behalf of other people, because we know that's a major issue for folk. The second stage is listening to all of that stuff, putting it together and having conversations with people. We're going to be looking at doing a lot of different things. So we're going to be using our recovery conversation cafe approach and um, we have a toolkit which is on our website if people are interested um, to provide these small group discussion um, online and in person spaces where people can talk about what's important to them, share their experiences and learning and sort of start to work towards what would make things better. Um, but we're also looking at having um, one-to-one -one opportunities for people to have one-to-one -one conversations because their experience elsewhere is that sometimes people like trust and engagement or trust in services and this is a really good way in to get people to maybe feel more comfortable getting a part in group discussions. Um, we're also looking at uh, using creative opportunities, uh, particularly photo voice um, and we're getting trained up on that and we'll be training our lived experience project group so that people can have different ways to feed in and ways that maybe feel more comfortable and in control for them. And we will be looking at whether uh, online surveys or, you know, questionnaires that go out to groups uh, will be important. And finally, we will be working with lots of local groups to help them gather uh, feedback and gather what's important to people um, from their own groups. So there's going to be a whole programme and some of it we will run ourselves, some of it we will support other people to do. Coming out of that we'll identify key themes and share them and then the third stage we will then return to the key themes and we will bring people who've been involved in the engagement so far and people from Healthcare Improvement Scotland and others together to start to look at well, what actually would be the proposals that we would uh, come up with to address some of the issues or to put into practice some of the ideas that people are coming up with. And that is where we and we will also feed that into Healthcare Improvement Scotland. So we feel it's really important that people don't just say what's important to them, but we provide them with really good structured and supported opportunities to develop those into proposals. Next slide, slide please. So as I say, lots and lots of different ways that people can get uh, involved. Um, one I didn't mention was we are very much looking at how, particularly with the project group, but with others, we can maybe uh, gather some stories of experience that can be used to illustrate, you know, what needs to change, but also what the possibilities of change are. So what's worked for people um, and what's, what's, what can help us decide what good looks like. Um, I think sometimes in engagement, it's very, very easy to get stuck on what's wrong. And what we really try and do is figure out with people what good would be like. And next slide, please. So finally, we are looking for um, four um, uh, outputs to come from our work. One would be new relationships and we'd really like at national and local level to have groups, uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland and professionals in the NHS working closer together or being aware of each other and understanding that there's a really productive dialogue to be had. We know that lots of people want to do it, but sometimes no, people just don't know how to make it happen. So we're hoping that some of this will really help to start that process or to cement it in some areas. We'll produce a final report, which will include everything that we've heard from people about what needs to change, the ideas for change and their proposals, and also some reflections on the engagement process and what we could learn for going forward. We will also produce a practice learning resource that takes some of what we found and is hopefully offers people and services some really practical examples of things they can do um, and things they can develop and uh, ways they can not only increase their knowledge and understanding, but put that into practice. And finally, we will produce hopefully more than one, but a video or a podcast where people who've been involved in this uh, process of engagement 
and developing proposals will be able to talk about their experience of that, what they've learned and the messages that they have for services in their area. So that's uh, where we're at. Uh, we're at the early stages, but we have had, like today, I can see the numbers. We've had really good response to our initial reach out and we're running information sessions and we're already in discussions with lots of people about how they can get involved. Um, this is not going to be an easy process and we've already had lots of people talking to us about their concerns in this area, but I think it's one where taking this length of time and talking and listening to people could really help not only to increase our understanding and our determination to make things better, but could take some of the challenges and the heat out of some situations and bring out that more fruitful dialogue. Um, I've put a, a, I put my name in at the beginning with our website in it and I will put my email address and if anybody wants to get in touch, um, please just get in touch with us either through our website or um, uh, by e call, emailing us um, uh, and the, the message I put in the, the chat. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Louise. That was fantastic. Can I just check, um, Jim Dunn, um, I think you, you've had your hand up for some time. Um, just wanted to check if, if there was something that you wanted to comment on or is it a kind of legacy hand or is it up accidentally? Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. Yes, I've I've not been able to access the chat chat function. OK. Um, I'm not sure what the problem with that is. I, th I think some some of our other attendees have had an issue with that and logging out and logging back in has helped, which sounds a bit like the kind of IT response to turn the computer on and off, but I think it sometimes works. If it doesn't, um, if you hold on at the, at the end of the, the session, we can, we can have a discussion round about um, what your input would have been. Is that okay? Okay, thanks very much. Okay, just okay. So, um, I'd like to hand over to uh, our second um, <coughs> clinical lead within the program, that's Dr. Michelle Feldman, again from NHS Greater Glasgow, um, who's going to speak about psychological therapies. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you, Gordon. Um, thank you to the three previous speakers. Um, I'm delighted to be part of today and of this important and timely process in Scotland. Um, I'm pleased to get the chance today to speak to you about the evidence around psychological therapies for people with borderline uh, personality disorder. Next slide, please. In short, um, we know that the evidence for treatments for BPD is growing, and um, I think it's fair to say that there's reason for optimism and hope and how we can use this evidence in, um, in Scotland with, with our pro project. I will take you through a few slides to say more, highlighting the main um, evidence we have for this. Next slide, please. If we start with looking at the evidence for high quality research, um, just briefly, it's worth looking at randomized control trials and how um, and the increase of that over the last eight years. Um, the randomized control trials, trials is a gold standard for scientific evidence to help us to design, decide about service design. And we can see from this bar chart um, just the very significant increase in the number of these high quality studies. Now, the reason I, I picked that was also to remind us just for each of these 75 RCTs in the last um, number of years, there will be hundreds, if not thousands, of other relevant and good studies published that helps guide us in the, um, which direction to travel with thinking about effective service design. Next slide, please. Just the previous one. I'll just have a quick look at this one, a quick look at why it's difficult to study a problem area such as um, borderline personality disorder. 
um, there is a large, a diverse range of presentations and a diverse range of study designs. By that, I, I mean that there's a large range of symptoms reported and that people describe in very different ways. And to then, um, for, to, for studies to, to be designed and to decide what to measure specifically with this diverse range of presentations, make scientific research and clean cut research very difficult. In particular, it's then difficult to compare different studies um, and to get um, larger groups of studies together to to help us to uh, to give us a scientific backup for what to uh, what services to deliver. Um, the other thing is high quality studies very often miss out on clinical evidence that's more reflective in routine clinical work. Um, for example, these studies, it will be difficult to understand the elements of the therapeutic relationship, difficult to really understand the lived experience and how people would articulate um, what looks good and what, what works for them. Next slide, please. So in Scotland, we've got the matrix guideline to inform us about what therapies um, have evidence for which difficulties. Um, so have a look at that. Uh, this is just a list of therapies. It's by no means an exhaustive list of therapies that have been studied and that have some evidence base. Um, I'm putting up this list and, and talking about this to simply demonstrate that we are in an era whereby we have learned a lot about what works. The matrix also suggests that these are higher intensity therapies and should be delivered in secondary care, should be made available um, but, um, in, in secondary care and specialist services where possible um, one or two of, of those in, in, in an area. Next slide, please. By studying, we're studying comparing the specialist therapies that I've just uh, mentioned in the previous slide. Um, researchers also found that well-organized and skillful, good principle approaches within teams, that's not the specific and in, intense therapies, that that can be very effective with, with um, problems presented as borderline personality disorder. These three are just examples of these approaches, whole team approaches um, that have been published and manualized. And we find um, in the UK and in Scotland that some organisations would have developed their own guidelines and pieces of work um, based on these whole team approaches. Next slide, please. So the question to ask if we look beyond the list of therapies and, and big names of therapies is to use um, Louise's, our previous speaker's quote, what, what good looks like. So in these therapies, um, are there common factors? Are there common things that help us um, to understand um, better outcomes. So this and my this slide and my next slide, I'm going to talk about that. Um, the, um, so what are the things that some therapies have in common? Um, so with initial therapeutic stance, this is before we decide what therapies to deliver, um, before we meet each other in a therapy um, situation, that initial stance is very important. There's a lot written about that. Um, first point is organisational willingness, uh, whether an organisation is prepared to understand the complexities and to invest in, um, in compassionate services for these kind of difficulties. And whether the organisation support clinicians who have a genuine interest and to choose to work with this and find this kind of work meaningful. 
then um, we're looking at different factors that the, the different therapies have in common that definitely helps outcome is the, the uh, therapeutic relationship. And the two points there, and um, we can speak a lot about the, the importance of therapeutic relationship and what good looks in a therapeutic relationship. But in short, that it starts off with genuine empathy and validation. As humans, we want to be understood, so that that's very much part of it. And that also, um, next to that, that one works collaboratively in an active way towards what can be meaningful changes and meaningful things in that alliance. Next slide, please. And further important features in these different therapy modalities in the different studies that have been researched are, I've summarized that in different bullet points and will um, quickly go through that to help us think. These are, this in the previous slide is the interesting things around what we can bring to our service design to help improve outcome. Treat the treatment is well structured and that these an active stance for both the clinician and the client in, in treatment. That there's always a quality assurance that we have a, um, experienced staff with high quality training that also receive space and time for supervision. Um, that if, um, there's a belief in the model that one works with and that, that, there's, uh, that it's underpinned with a theory. And um, the next two points um, around clinician observation and client self observation are, um, I think, very interesting and very, very important. The clinician self observation about what am I doing well and what can I improve, a sense of a, a mutual responsibility, and the client's self observation about what's going on for me internally and externally. Um, all treatment models agree that working with these kind of problems, they need to be high skill in managing risk. And then lastly, um, but by no means least, is that a treatment, whichever model one employs, um, that is formulation driven. In, in other words, that it's not about the label, but it's about the range of factors in a person's life in the past and the present a present that brought them to this point in their lives. Um, and in Scotland, we also have the National Trauma Framework that helps all clinicians um, promote a trauma-informed work. Um, so I, I trust that this this is my life, last slide. Am, am I right with that? Um, I trust that this brief look at evidence um, was interesting and will continue to inform our programme and influence our service design in Scotland. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, so we've we've got some time for, for a couple of questions. There's, there's been uh, a lot of questions round about um, CAMS. So um, Andy Williams is, is, is going to take that that question just now. Andy? Yes. I'm I'm delighted there's so many good questions. Um and I take the point absolutely about CAMS should not be a, a sort of a, a bolt on or add on thought. I suppose the limitations of this programme are that it has been um commissioned to look at adult services primarily. So I'm afraid the nature of this this one piece of work is around at the current state of adult services and um the experience of adults in, in our systems. That is not to say that we, we, we don't, you know, we're clinicians, Michelle, myself and Gordon um, first, and of course we recognise that development of some of these difficulties is you know, the prime time to, to be thinking about them is in childhood and adolescence. I think all I can do is, is hope, and I think it's probably all of our hope, that this is a first piece of work and that we will um, you know, maybe progress on to, to exploring things in more detail in, in CAM services and thinking about perinatal um, experiences as well. I think there was another comment about that. But it's just really an invitation, please, to anyone who has asked all the good questions about, you know, areas that we maybe haven't touched on today, 
to suggest them as topics for our webinars and to come to the to the workshops and webinars so that we can discuss these things and shape the work um, going forward. So that, I'll, I'll keep it brief um, and pass back to Gordon. I hope that's part, partly answered the question. Thanks, Andy. I, I think that's a really um, crucial point about how we shape the brief. As I outlined in, in, in my presentation, th th this is about understanding what, what the landscape is now. You know, I know that Andy had, had spoke uh, in her presentation about some of the previous research that had been done, but we're in unprecedented times. We've had two and a half years of um, of COVID. We were in a situation where lot, lots of boards that, uh, to, to my knowledge, were, were working on integrated care pathways that, that, that all got kind of kicked into the long grass during COVID and are hopeful about um, revitalising some of that work. But so we're hoping to to harness some of some of that enthusiasm to to, to rebuild. Um, but in the first instance, we need to understand the system that we're in and, and work to the commission that the Scottish Government have given us, uh, I guess. Those are where our deliverables are as a programme. Um, but clearly, CAMS, perinatal mental health, they're, they're all crucially important. Um, they're all they're all part of that broader system, and we will absolutely look to have meaningful discussion round about them. Again, not just a bolt on, but meaningful discussion, which will then go on to inform our recommendations for phase two work. Um, I was going to answer a, 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 another question if, I, if we've still got time. So, um, someone had asked about the expert reference group, and they'd asked about. Um, lived experience representation with on that on, on that group and and it's a core part of the of that of this of the expert reference group. I mean, lo lots of people are experts by experience of uh, um, of living with um, some of the issues that we're we're talking about through personality disorder. Um, we are we will have a, we've got a coach two co both co chairs come from. The Scottish Personality Dis Disorder Network. So, Tim, as one, comes from a clinical background. The other person will be one of the members with lived experience. We have uh, input from the Scottish Carers Trust on that group. The the program of work that Louise spoke about will feed directly into to that reference group. We will have individuals identified from th that engagement work. Um, been represented within the, the expert reference group. Um, th th I said in my presentation that th there's nothing tokenistic about the lived experience input in, into this programme. It's vital and it's essential and it's at the heart of the work that we're doing. Um, there was there was another question around about the project that was asking about, I think, the strategic gap analysis work. And it was asking, I think, about um, mapping is the mapping work been done around about specialist personality disorder services or staff working with people in other parts of the service and it, i don't know that the boards will necessarily thank us for the comprehensive nature of the structured conversation that we've devised to, to have with them um, but it will absolutely look at the, the whole system um, there are, there are very few um, boards in scotland in any event that i think they have um, specialist services as such We'll be speaking with um, a broad range of people from health boards and health and social care partnerships to look at the the breadth of, of, of their systems and look at where the how they're structured, what the key challenges are, what their aspirations are, um, and look to compile all of that information from all all of the boards in Scotland. Um, and I noticed that Michelle's got her hand up just now, so I'll. I'll be quiet. Hi, Gordon. I, I'm just thought I'll pick up on one of the questions that seem to have a, a, a good few sort of endorsements there around the inco incompatibility between evidence based treatments that are time consuming. We need to invest in time and the current policies around waiting times and just I guess generally people feeling um, a volume of work in in different service psychological services and 
and secondary care services in any way really and um, I of course don't have an answer to that but just that um, just to um, note that it is a topic of conversation in our PDIP in the team very much the excitement and in the evidence base, the excitement about possibilities in Scotland with this um, coming out with the, with this programme and with all the partnerships and shareholders and how we need to balance that excitement and that all that new things with the reality of mental health services and feeling under-resourced, people feeling overworked and indeed having um, pressure such as waiting waiting times and um, e-targets are also there and there's not an un a, a clear answer to that but just to um to help boards and localities with this process hopefully to streamline what they begin to think they want to deliver and to increase staff's ex expertise around that um, and definitely for his for healthcare improvement scotland to be sensitive about um just the the busyness and um tiredness of the workforce and to balance that with with new developments thanks michelle um I, I, th I think we're actually out of time um, just now. So uh, I noticed that there, there are a few hands up. What we will absolutely, we will we'll do a review of the questions and some of the answers and we'll distribute stuff out to all participants um, after the event. I think um, we're, we're probably at time just now. So can we have the next slide, please? Can we move the next slide, please? I think the slides have dropped off, Gordon. I think okay. the thing was about the evaluation. OK, right. So um, we will be sending out uh, an evaluation of, of today and a link in the chat box. We'll follow up with some email correspondence. And as I said, the, 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 the Q&A part of this, we'll, we'll, we'll address that. And, and as Andy and Michelle both said, we're hopeful to have lots more representation, lots more discussion at the, the, the workshops and the webinars, but um, we've got a finite amount of time today um, and we'll be updating with regular monthly um, newsletters around about the progress and uh, of the programme, the next things that are that are coming up in our schedule. Um, I think you all have the, is that a slide coming up? Yes, it is. If we could put that onto the final slide, please, just to the, the keep in touch section. Um, so there we go. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch, well, the team email address is, is there and the, the website is there as well. I think the, the, the final thing to say is just thanks for everyone that, that attended today and participated with questions. I'm sure, sorry we can't answer everyone individually just now, but um, this is the launch webinar. This is about giving an overview of the programme aim, how we intend to, to deliver on that work and engage with you guys um, in shaping the, the, the programme and producing the recommendations for phase two of the work. So just now it's about understanding the nature of uh, our services, what the landscape's like, and, and have an informed debate around about that and into phase two for for other improvements. Thanks very much for, for coming along, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.